Welcome everybody to the second part of this uh, panel. As you know, it is um, hosted by the CF uh, Ethnology of Religion Working Group. We welcome you all to participate also in the conferences that take place in between the CF conferences, that is to say in Berlin in 2022, most likely. If you want to uh, stay tuned with the working group, you can just send me your email address and we will add you to the information that we send out concerning this uh, working group. Um, now that we're here, um, we want to continue to uh, talk about our uh, today's um, topic. We have five speakers. Uh, we want to continue to talk about rules and bodies in richest context. We have five speakers in the second session. We uh, uh, would like you to speak for 12 minutes only. We will tell you after 10 minutes that you should come to your final conclusion. And we would like to do the discussion uh, collectively in the end of the session. That is to say, after around about an hour, we want to discuss all the papers at the same time. So I guess I hand over to you, Anna, in order to introduce the first speaker. Hey, thank you so much, Thorsten. And yes, nice seeing you guys again. And uh, our first speaker is Monika Hirmer from the SOAS. Uh, she works on her PhD at the School of, Afri of Oriental and African Studies, University of London. And she has been doing extensive fieldwork in South India. Um, she holds also a master's degree from the university, I don't know how to read it, Hyderabad, plus also MA in South Asian Area Studies from SOAS University of London. And I believe that today we will hear a bit more on her PhD project. And the title of the presentation is Whose Binaries, Ultimate Femininity and the Participation in Cosmic Motherhood among, again, difficult to read for me, Sri Vidya practitioners in South India. I believe Monika will correct me very soon. So the floor is your yours and after like 10 minutes i will start signaling that you still have two minutes to go okay great thank you so much uh anna in person and hello everyone thanks for having me um yes as anna was saying um i have been working on this goddess tradition uh called Sri vidya which is the which is part of the larger group of tantric traditions and revolves around goddess tripura sundari uh, and it mainly foresees that practitioners identify with this goddess, irrespectively of their gender, thus uh, challenging um, Eurocentric binaries such as the human and the divine uh, division, as well as the male and female division. Now, mainstream Western concepts of uh, body and beingness in general have been questioned by several scholars by now. Among these, there are uh, Tim Ingold, who challenges the genealogical model of beingness, which is based on uh, blood kinship, proposing instead a relational model where um, persons are continuously coming into being through their relationship with others and with the environment. Philippe de Scola instead uh, questions the universality of the notion of humanness itself by showing that there are culturally specific ways of dividing the human from the non-human. And I find such concepts uh, helpful when looking at beingness and bodies among Sri Vidya practitioners, since uh, they have this um, particular way of interacting with goddess Tripura Sundari. Um, now, before analyzing how identity with Tripura Sundari is evoked, a few words on uh, my fieldwork site, Sri Vidya and the goddess. Now, the con the temple complex, which I call Shaktipur, this is a pseudonym, you can see uh, in the photograph, is in a rural area in South India, where I lived for more than a year, and it has been built relatively recently in the 80s. And uh, on a daily basis, um, they live about 15 priestesses and priests. Um, and the visitors that come on a daily basis... Uh, uh, at about uh, 150 to 200, whereas during special festivals, they can go up to 2000 and come from major Indian cities, but also from abroad. Um, differently from mainstream Hindu traditions, uh, Shaktipur rejects any caste and gender-based restrictions, which makes it very, yeah, in, in mainstream Hinduism instead, it's, it's reserved to Brahminical uh, male 
um, figures. Um, in Shaktipur, in fact, everyone can learn rituals and become priestess or priest, and there are about two thirds of practitioners who are women. Um, now, Shrividya is an esoteric tradition um, that was widespread in India until about the 17th century before undergoing a process of sanitization or largely becoming secret. It revolves around goddess Tripura Sundari, as we said, and her name Tripura Sundari means uh, the beautiful one of the three cities. And as you can see, she is indeed very beautiful. Um, and um, in addition to being um, beautiful, she is also motherly and sensual. Uh, she is the goddess of love and pleasure, in fact, and is worshipped as the origin and end of everything manifest and not manifest. And as such, she is all per pervasive. In her, creative, um, in her creative activity as Cosmic Mother, she is supported by her consort Shiva, uh, on whom she is uh, sitting, as you can see here, and this is Shiva. And uh, as my informants say, she is enjoying this union. So it has this erotic element uh, going throughout. Um, the aim of Sri Vidya, as we said, is to awaken the goddess in each practitioner, identify with her, and please her. Uh, and this can be either an end in itself, or this identity can be um, uh, can be uh, aimed for in order to obtain the powers of the goddess and use these powers in the everyday life. In addition to appearing as a beautiful anthropomorphic figure, Tripura Sundari also embodies the Shri Chakra, as is shown here in the image. Uh, this is a sacred diagram made of interlocking triangles and lotus petals. Um, and um, accordingly, the goddess can be worshipped in a number of ways. She can be worshipped externally by uh, being offered flowers, incense, food, and other items to either the, the anthropomorphic uh, idol or to the Shri Chakra. And this external worship is the most common form of worship also among mainstream temples. Internally, uh, she can be worshipped through visualizations um, evoked by uh, mantra chanting or meditations, and finally through the body. And this is in fact the most uh, esoteric path, considered the fastest way uh, to please the goddess and realize this union with her, but it's also the most dangerous way. Now, the identification with Tripura Sundari builds on the identity between the microcosm in practitioners' bodies and the macrocosm of the, um, of the goddess's body and the entire universe. Um, in fact, each portion, um, as you can see from the, no, not, in, sorry, it's coming in the next uh, image. Um, each portion of the body uh, corresponds to a portion in the goddess's body and also um, all the different elements of the macrocosm are in, inside uh, each practitioner's body, such as the sun, the moon and the fire and, and everything. These superimpositions uh, become evident through the Shri Chakra, um, which in fact is aptly described by one of my teachers as the genetic code of the cosmos. And the, the superimpositions emerge also through the chakras, which are these energy, um, the, the, these, these here, these colored, uh, these here are the chakras. Some of you may be familiar with them from yoga or, or other traditions, and they are along the spinal column. Now, as you can see here, so this here is the Shri Chakra, um, and the, it has nine levels, and uh, each level corresponds to an element, to a portion of the body. Um, see, so for example, this outer square corresponds to the feet, and then the, 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 the level with the 16 lotus petals corresponds to the, to the tithe, actually, and so on and so forth. And these are in the goddess, and then also in the body of any uh, male or female practitioner. Now, um, so these metaphysical underpinnings are put into practice through a series of rituals. And here I focus on a ritual called Kalavahana, since it's part of the more esoteric rituals, and it is uh, considered to be very powerful and revolves around the body. Kalavahana is a worship uh, of the Sri Chakra, where, however, it's the body that is considered the Sri Chakra, as we have seen in the images before. The ritual was introduced by Shaktipur's guru and is thus unique to its followers. And it's meant to first awaken the goddess in the ritual receiver. And once the identity is established, the goddess is worshipped in human form. 
it's performed in this small shrine, as you can see, it's a very intimate uh, shrine of about three by three meters, where almost the entire floor is occupied by the goddess's yoni or womb. And you can see these are her thighs, and this is these are her genitalia, and the ritual receiver sits on uh, in, in this portion. And the ritual consists on three, of three parts. First, the priestess or priest uh, chants mantras and touches the different chakras uh, on the ritual receiver's body, thus awakening the rays of the sun, the fire, the moon, and all the aspects of the goddess. In the second phase, once the receiver has become the goddess, uh, the receiver slash goddess are offered various items, such as flowers, incense, and food. And then the most elaborate offering is a bath with lukewarm water and perfumed um, with, with rose oil and other spices. And finally, once the goddess uh, slash ritual receiver are thus um, worshipped, they uh, bless the ritual giver. So there is a transfer of energy, a continuous uh, transfer. Now, uh, this ritual, whereby both men and women alike establish identity with Tripura Sundari, who is a feminine, a very female uh, goddess, um, make us reflect on how body, gender, and modes of being human in general are understood, and they challenge mainstream Eurocentric dichotomous notions. Now, obviously, concerning the body, um, Shrividya bodies do not follow a scientific understanding of bodies exclusively. In fact, in addition to the material body, there is the subtle body of chakras. So, uh, whereas the material body is different for men and women, also in, in for Shri chakra practitioners, the um, sorry for Shrividya practitioners, um, uh, the, the the body of chakras is instead ungendered. However, also concerning the, the material body, um, there is a different conception. In fact, in every um, the, the, the practitioner stressed that uh, male and female genitalia are both present in everyone. So the tip of the penis, in fact, is understood as a vagina and the clitoris as a phallus. Concerning gender, instead, um, as we have seen, the goddess is all pervasive, so there is an all pervasive femininity, since uh, Tripura Sundari is the substratum of everything existing and also yet to exist. Not only are men and women identified with uh, the goddess during Kalabahana, in fact, also during everyday life, a very common way of addressing both men and women is Amma. And Amma is this uh, feminine noun indicating mother as well as goddess. Thus reminding men and women that they are not only the products of the feminine, um, of the ultimate femininity, but they are also uh, active participants and sustainers of this creative force. And finally, um, also concerning the ontology, uh, beingness, um, through the connection between the material and the subtle body, the identity between the micro and the macro um, cosm, the overlap between the human and the divine, practitioners transcend a purely human nature and tap into divinity. Uh, the very notion of what it means to be human is thus challenged and calls for creative ways of overcoming dominant binaries. Um, now, I suggested a fruitful, way, a fruitful way of thinking about the modes of being of Srividya practitioners is through a spectrum of expansion and contraction. Um, and this element is also recurrently mentioned by practitioners themselves. Um, and in fact, this expansion contraction can be applied to body, gender, and ontology itself. Um, from like concerning the body, from a uh, subtle, contracted, undifferentiated, energetic body of chakras, through expansion, this energy becomes manifest and material, thus assuming the finite, tangible attributes of the physical body. Uh, when it comes to gender, from its contracted status as ultimate and default femininity, uh, this substratum expands and becomes gendered. And in fact, in, um, in the expanded uh, material realm, men and women do acquire gender roles. Uh, and similarly, when it comes to beingness, uh, ontology in general, the divine, uh, the subtle uh, contracted divine, when it expands, manifests and becomes the tangible material differentiated world. 
Uh, just slightly, yeah. Yeah, I'm already thinking. Uh, we slightly cozy. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So, well, so yeah. I'm just finishing the aim of uh, Shividya, which is then to unite uh, with the goddess. The ultimate creative feminine energy can thus be seen as this effort by the practitioners to return to a status prior to the cosmic expansion and prior to the manifestation of divided genders and bodies and merge with the cosmic mother. Um, yeah. So that's that's it. Thank you. Uh, perfect, Monica. Uh, such an interesting topic, and I, I believe we will have many questions. Just technical issue, if someone would like to already put questions into the chat, either via Zoom or Hoover, or, well, please, please do it. And keep your questions for Monica. And thank you. Sorry for interruption at the end, but I wasn't sure how uh, how much yes. further you, you're going to uh, present. Anyway, let us uh, go now uh, for our second presenter, which is Anders Gustafsson. Uh, we'll be talking about on alcohol now. Alcohol rules and breaking of rules in religious setting in Sweden. And Anders uh, is our working group member, and he is a, a senior professor at the University of Oslo. He also was working in Lund as well as in Uppsala. And uh, his interests are on ethnology, folklore, uh, many various topics. Uh, alcohol is part of that and we'll learn more. He also was working on uh, death and um, traditions connected with with deaths and funerals. So uh, I hope it will work. Uh, Torsten is sharing his screen. And Anders, please, uh, the floor is yours. That is my new book, in proper use, Moderation or Total Abstinence of Alcohol. And now I will speak about religion and alcohol. And in this book, uh, edited in this year, uh, I have the first chapter, Moderation in the Rural Countryside. And uh, I have the other one is Moderation at Church Rituals. On the third is three church revival movements and total abstinence uh, on, on the next temperance movements and total abstinence. So first, I the first part of my lecture will be about moderation in the countryside on the next revi uh, religious revival movements and total abstinence. Next. In my book, this new book, I have studied three approaches to alcohol. That is moderation, improper use, and total abstinence. Uh, in the late 1800s and early 1900s, there was in Sweden a struggle between the principle of moderation and the principle of total abstinence from alcohol. Moderation was the dominant view, while total abstinence was advocated by free church revival movements and temperance movements. My question in this book <coughs> are, how did the context between different approaches unfold? What was improper use? How was the principle of total abstinence upheld through control on sanctions? This study also pay attention to how priests perceive alcohol and also try to influence, influence the people. Next. The principle of moderation was given a religious justification among country people. Alcohol was considered a gift of God, not to be despised unless it was abused. Abuse was not um, okay. An outlook like this could be preached by the clergy. This view among some priests led them to reject both excess of alcohol consumption and the total abstinence. It is told of a priest in Deutschland, the province of Deutschland, um, um, the, no, I quote, it is so disgusting to see a drunk person, but it is just as disgusting when a good Templar also total abstinence, goes pointing the finger at those who have had too much. So it is good with moderation, but not with abuse, but also not with total abstinence. Next. At the same time, the priest had to perform a balancing act in front of his parishioners when it came to alcohol. 
he would be viewed with contempt if he was so drunk that he fell over while officiating in the church. We had also pro-temperance priests, and they could encounter resistance in their locality. It was also believed that priests who fought for abstinence could become victims of witchcraft. This could transform them from champions of temperance to abusers of alcohol, total change. The oral narratives I have studied served as tools in the struggle against the principle of total abstinence. The countryside people didn't want to have this um, total abstinence. So there was a very hard struggle between moderation and total abstinence. Uh, next. Now I will go to section two, and that is about free church revival movements. And they wanted, uh, their id ideology was total abstinence, uh, in contrast to earlier moderation. And uh, I have studied some of them, for example, the Pentecostal movement on the island of Ostol, a little island in Bushland in western Sweden, north of Gothenburg, near the Norwegian border. In the late 1800s, free church revival movements that demanded total abstinence from alcohol were established in Sweden. One of my case studies focused on the island of Ostol. The community there was dominated by fishing. Uh, the Pentecostal movement was established on Ostol in 1923, uh, and there were inspiration among the fishers from England and so in these Pentecostals. On this uh, little uh, movement, uh, grew rapidly during the 1920s. Next, here we see this island in uh, 1930. Uh, so you see how uh, all these fishing uh, houses, and we see also in the middle the harbor with these fishing boats. So uh, there was some 500 people living there. Next. And here we see some of these Pentecostalists in 1930. There we see women and men. And at that time they were black dressed and with a black hat and so on. So that is from the beginning of this congregation, 1930. Next. During the 1930s and 40s, exclusions took place concerning members who had violated the norm of total abstinence from alcohol. This congregational discipline served as a means of drawing a sharp dividing line between the congregation and outsiders in the total mi local milieu. Or, this is connected with the conception of the body as a temple of the Holy Spirit. First letter to the Corinthians. As long as the Elim, Pentecostal congregation was a minority until end of the 40s, um, it had hardly any effect on the way of life outside the group. Uh, many interviewees have related how common the consumption of alcohol was, especially during the Second World War. But next, uh, but after uh, the Second World War, we had a uh, a big fishing and also big uh, um, revival movements. So uh, new Pentecostal revivals took place at the end of 40s, 1948 or so. And the, this congregation became a dominant local culture for the first time. Then the Pentecostalists could bring social sanctions against the outsiders as well. How did the outsiders among the local inhabitants react on that? An outward adaption took place with regard to alcohol during 60s and 70s, when we have this majority situation for the congregation. Informants both from the congregation and outside, I have interviewed both of them, it have pointed out that in these three cases, hardly any cases of intoxication in public occurred, but uh, uh, in, in secret they could drink the outsiders. Nor did villagers outside the congregation protest all openly against the, uh, the store, uh, not selling snuff, 
cigarettes and beer. It was before we had so many guests there. The storekeeper, he was one of the first to be converted in the revival of 1948. He was uh, dis decided not to sell snuff, cigarettes or beer when he became a storekeeper. Uh, we cannot uh, send, um, uh, sell uh, alcohol, other, yeah, um, both kinds so in, in, in our shops, but we can sell, sell beer, but he wanted not to sell beer. Next, here he is um, in the 60s uh, when he had no, no alcohol to sell. Uh, on the light alcohol, light beer, and so. Uh, when he is now living, on, he's born in 1928. Next. Beside these visible forms of behavior, accommodation, not drinking alcohol, uh, regarding you during the 60s and 70s, uh, outsiders have also developed other forms which they try to keep hidden. Uh, in order to avoid the sanctions from the congregation. This covert behavior was an expression of silent protest. Covert forms of behavior occurred inside the homes. There they could drink so that the, the members of the congregation couldn't see, couldn't see it. During in the 60s, some young people uh, began to consume alcohol in in accessible clefts in the hostel. This use, um, some of them, were those who were most isolated from the congregation. They have not been members of there. However, the meetings among the rocks grew fewer in the mid 70s. So when I took a photo in 1981, there were no young people any longer. Of this, uh, change in the 70s should be seen in the light of the fact that the sports club on the island restarted at this point. So th they could go there instead of uh, drinking alcohol in, in the clefts. Next. Here is uh, my photo from 1981. On, uh, far away from the center, they could be there hidden from the congregation on drink alcohol during the majority situation for the congregation. Next. So in summary, a revival movement can extend its influence beyond uh, their own group if it can function as a dominant local culture. That was in the 40s, 50s and 60s. But uh, conflicts may exist under the surface. I have uh, given examples of that. Uh, this has been expressed in covert behavior uh, on in critical accounts, also this uh, um, oral messages uh, about the dominant group in Ostol. Only when the situation on dominance weakened in the 70s, then it was possible for more open forms of criticism again against the alcohol restrictions. On, uh, during the 80s and 90s, we have also got many summer guests, so they will also drink alcohol. But uh, So we can see over time uh, there is some different situations. I will also say uh, two words about a new book called Pentecostalism in Sverige, 2020, that means in English, Pentecostalism in Sweden during the 2000s, uh, 2020s. That is a new book. Uh, so um, on, I have written about the Oasis movement uh, in Sweden, the charismatic movement. So it is a, a, a new research about Pentecostalism. We have many scholars about that. So that was a, an example of moderation on total abstinence, on, I choose this Pentecostal uh, congregation as an example. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anders. It's actually perfect timing, uh, 12 minutes, and so with help by Torsten, I think it really worked very well. Uh, so please keep questions for Anders for further discussion. Uh, well, interesting on the 
alcohol. And now we are switching to um, uh, Mircha Paduraru. I hope I pronounce your name relatively correct. And to the Orthodox Christianity. Uh, and Mircha, who is a professor of ethnology and folklore at Universitat Alexandru Ioan Cusa uh, in Iasi, will present a paper, The Construction of Relics in Modern Romania. So we'll be talking about mm -hmm. uh, dead bodies um, and how do they become relics. Um, so Please, Mircha, uh, you can also make like the full screen mode, but we okay, can see uh, your presentation I, I, already. Um, yeah, it's okay. Uh, okay. Oh, perfect. Now okay. it's perfect. Yeah. Okay. Okay, good. So, so, so uh, hello. So when, when corpses do not rot, yeah, uh, it is they, do, they do not follow, you know, the usual uh, common biological rule. They uh, are capable of igniting uh, the religious imagination of people. So an unrooted body can indicate yeah, either uh, a bad person, cursed, so on, either on the contrary, a saint. And when this thing uh, happens in Romania, uh, always the Orthodox Church uh, steps in to, to offer a, a point of view. So, uh, but although it is a national state uh, church, uh, it was also a big one, uh, uh, composed by you know elite theologians, uh, countryside priests, and pious monks, and uh, superstitious believers, and so on. So uh, th this this makes it you know uh, not a you know monolithic Christian domain, but rather Christianities. Yeah. So uh, in in my paper, I shall refer to uh, contested relics, because anyway, relics is a is a topic for for contestation in uh, in. Uh, well, everywhere almost. So I shall have in mind two kinds of corpses, two kinds of relics, put it how you want it. Unusual corpses, yeah, displaying unusual qualities, but no biographies, and biography is important when, when uh, canonization uh, is, is in, in question. Uh, or uh, unusual corpses, but highly problematic biographies, yeah. So uh, I shall uh, look at some pictures together with you. Uh, look, for instance, here there is a a skull which uh, springs chrism from a political prison in Ayud, a famous detention center. Uh, here it is in this picture. You may find, you may see, if you look carefully, oil and, uh, and, and the box. Uh, here's another guy from Raden. These are these are anonymous saints or anonymous uh, human remains, but uh, interesting enough. So uh, about this Yossi from Raden, we know that his body is uh, incorrupt, as they say it. But also, we know about him that he was a quiet person and that he wrote religious poetry. That's all, not, nothing more. Also, his icon is uh, also important. Also, uh, these two guys that we, I'll be presenting you are, are uh, important saints. They are quite, uh, or important figures. They have a, an established cult in, in Romania, but they have really um, important biographical problems. So this is Gheorghe Calciu, uh, Yes, uh, here it is, also Icon, and this is Ilia Lakatushu, very famous, both of them, with pilgrimages, with uh, um, all sorts of things. But they have a little problem in their lives. In, in the, between the two world wars, they were part of the legion of the Archangel Mikhail, an extreme orthodoxist, ultranationalist movement. So uh, this is a, a, a serious problem for them. Okay, so in this, uh, in my talk, I shall refer to these uh, issues uh, in the perspective of material religion. We, we talked about uh, today uh, many times, uh, Billy my religion as mediation, uh, David Morgan, and so on. So this is my, my perspective. Okay, uh, first of all, I shall talk about contesting relic narratives, right? So, of course, these narratives which come up in this community I'm exploring uh, usually are uh, a collection of miracula, right? Reactivating the commonplaces of every relic discourse as powerful objects materializing the, the divine. Yes, they never describe the materiality per se, which is um, as you saw it, but rather the theological category, not the matter per se. So, so this, be, this, be, this provokes, you know, uh, uh, encomiastical discourses, poetical description, and so on. Also, these narratives are very important for me because they are, they function as indicators for the reception of relics. So they instruct the believers into their alternative ontology. Okay, uh, 
Oh, wait, more than the, the narrative, of course, is the disciplining of the body, the tuning of the senses, which happens in, in, the, in the participation in, in, the, in their worship. So, of course, they, they are always surrounded by a complex sensorial uh, medium, yeah. Of course, not only liturgical chants, the presence of others, the icons of the saint, the visual and the perfume, the liturgical engagements, postures, expectancies, all tune and lead the believer into the divine. They all trigger emotional responses confirmed and verbalized throughout the community of faith during and after the event. Um, of course, when, when uh, the act of worshiping happens, uh, you know, uh, um, supernatural experiences are, are available for the ritualized bodies, yeah? So where there is a mouth there, relics can talk, laugh, open their eyes, move the hands, spring chrism state, spread the state of, uh, of inner peace, provoke the vanishing of devils, of devils from the possessed healings and so on. Of course, if you are there, you, you, you may notice the, the fact that they really do have an agency in, in this context, in this medium, uh, uh, relics want to be touched, kissed, approached to, um, talked to, yeah. They, they shape indeed the worshippers uh, through the authorized postures and gestures to be performed. Of course, mostly despite the rules of the priests who manage them. Uh, I, I forgot to mention that in these, these relics are uh, in a way to be experienced in the open, no borders. So people can really touch, take them, uh, you know. So uh, even if there are priests there saying that uh, do not touch them, touch only the reliquary or the support, they usually uh, do that. They touch them and they kiss them and or, uh, to the, to the, in a way which is uh, sympathically and uh, encouraged by the priests themselves. So... Uh, also, uh, in these uh, events, uh, extremely important is the capturing of the supernatural as the, in the irregularity of the human remains, in their abnormal materiality. Yes, by immortalizing miracles at work, pictures, filming, all that. All that. So, um, in order to support the, the, the movement, the relics for further testimonies, to construct the miraculous scientific as a fact, but also for the actual situation, for the, for the experience in itself. Um, Okay, this huge amount of data, uh, visual data, exported by narratives and ongoing commentaries online will feed, yes, networks of sites, blogs, and orthodox uh, activist internet, challenging agnostics, of course, and uh, strengthening uh, faith in the believers. Yes, I, I should like just to point that here that technology really participates in the production of the sacred here. Although uh, in, in most of the orthodox places, uh, technology is somehow uh, seen uh, against religion or, or as, a, as a domain uh, more closer to, to uh, the devil and so on. So, uh, of course, th this experience uh, enhances group identity. There, there's a tone of open secrecy at work here, of closed group, right? Privileged access to, to the sacred and so on. And of course, there is also the, the conflictual attitude, okay, there's the contested relics, right? So there's anti-establishment, anti-hierarchy of the Orthodox Church, and the propensity to define by opposition. Of course, turning dead body into a living saint never takes place outside politics, negotiations, conflicts. Of course, there's an co open conflict to the Catholics and the Protestants who do not have such treasures, but also to the establishment of the Church, but also anti-European Union, anti-Ecumenica, anti-mask, anti-vaccination, anti-Pope, and so on. Well, these are uh, expressions of locality. Okay, they are Romanian saints, so they are, they are uh, but more important, they are regional expressions of, of the holy. So uh, the, the place of the saint, the village, is being also celebrated through the triumph of the relic. So this involves local economies, local important political players, right? Of course, local flower and uh, candle industry and local beggars, local and non local beggars, actually. Okay, so, but what is common to all these uh, to all these communities, because there are there are some some groups are the the omniscient, the the present far right extremist elements, not discreetly but quite quite emphatically placed placed there. So this this places the Orthodox Church in a very delicate position, and uh, it is forced actually not to 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 allow those uh, 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 manifestations and those relics, of course. So the conclusions are uh, briefly, yeah, of course, even in death, yet yeah, the body seems to be. Uh, such a site that where regimes of discourse and power inscribe themselves. In the case of, of uh, contested relics, yes, um, they, they tend to be uh, highly militant objects and very active in the 
sense of crisp and pain, yeah. And of course, one, one might look at these expressions as uh, in the selection of the corpses to be worshipped in terms of necropower, necropolitics, yes, as uh, this involves always a, a forceful silencing of the living dead who could be potentially, uh, who could enjoy potentially such a, such a, uh, um, 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 such a tra trajectory, such a biography, yeah. So in, in the end, my conclusion is that indeed contested relics work, you know, in, in the sense of uh, vernacular, uh, quite good because it seems that an unrecognized relic, but effective and with a dynamic cult can have in competition to other relics, you know, those confirmed by the church elite, the aura of the anti-establishment instance. And so could benefit of the whole symbolic capital of those who, from whatever reason, contest the center. Then, since any largely acknowledged authority becomes eventually equivalent with conventional thinking, the anti-establishment saint or relic situates itself in a tradition of irregularity, of contestation, and maybe of surprise. And because of that, far more interesting to the popular piety. Yeah, thank you. I shall stop here. Thank you so much, Mircha, really just showing it as well. Multi-layered production of meanings connected with dead bodies and personal as well as political dimensions. So yes, again, please keep questions, comments, and I think we can very nicely combine also uh, various papers. Um, and now we are yeah, continuing to be within the Orthodox Church tradition. And actually we are having two Two final papers are very closely connected also with autoethnography, and I would like to introduce first Rika Patrikainen. Please correct me in case of pronunciation. Very okay. nice. <laughs> yeah, trying. And uh, Rika, uh, as a researcher, uh, works at the University of Eastern Finland and uh, preparing a PhD. Mm, uh, and she will tell us more also uh, about her other uh, activity, which is a singer within the Orthodox Church tradition. And she holds also a degree in Orthodox uh, music singing, as far as I could check it. So uh, the presentation, as you can see, the cantors embody the voice in the Eastern Orthodox funeral rite, an auto-ethnographic approach. So please, Rika. Welcome. Thank you, Anna. So, dear all, as you can see in the first slide, I've slightly changed the focus of my presentation from singing liturgical texts to the act of singing itself. First, I want to play you one short prayer from the funeral service sung in the Finnish language. Well, this hymn, Trice Holy, is an important part of the Eastern Orthodox funerals around the world, also in the parish of Ilomansi, where I work as a cantor. Ilomansi is a congregation in the Orthodox Church of Finland. Singing at the Orthodox funeral, funerals is perform, performed by a choir led by a cantor or the cantor alone. During the pandemic, the hymn you just heard was chanted in my parish by me, the cantor alone, because singing together has not been possible at the same time as physical contacts, so vital for the process of mourning, have been restricted. I wanted you to hear the simple verse because the sun texts bear a lot of more information than pronouncing the words only. Chanting has a highly significant role in the Orthodox Church. Our services are sung from the beginning till the end, and the key figure that is responsible for the singing is the cantor, such as me. 
In this presentation, I will share with you some of my findings on the basis of doing autoethnography at Orthodox funerals, focusing on the function of the embodied act of singing as a part of the funeral service. Through my work as a singer at funerals, I became interested in the meaning of singing as a part of the rites concerning death. More exactly, I'm interested in the symbolic meaning of using the singing voice as a part of funeral rituals, which I explore in my doctoral thesis. In this paper, I focus on the Finnish funeral tradition and the method that I use is autoethnography, which means I use my own experiences to delve deeper in the mechanisms and meanings of ritual singing. I complement my own thoughts with interviews I have made with other cantors. Since I have just begun this part of my thesis, my remarks are only preliminary. A few words about the Orthodox funeral service. It's based on the use of prayers and hymns that date back some 1,000 years. They are repeated in preordained sequences. The same liturgical texts are chanted every time with very little variation. There's practically no improvisation in the worship. The main celebrant of the funeral service is the priest who follows a fixed choreography of liturgical movement. Yet since the services are solely sung, the role of the cantor is central. The human body functions as the only musical instrument in worship. Singing with your body is quite different from using a musical instrument for this purpose. A voice the body produces, especially the singing voice, is the voice that our bodies resonate with. The, the voice functions differently in each church space. Different spaces and materials have distinct, distinct kinds of acoustics. The cantor needs to hear and feel the resonance of the place in order to adjust her singing into the space. In this way, the whole church transforms into a liturgical sounding instrument. Also, the mourners are part of the acoustics and they influence the service both physically and mentally. You need to feel the space to find the resonance, but bringing your body as an instrument into the act of singing, also the physical posture and the state of mind are important. Since it's very difficult to look at the pain of the mourners, I turn my look towards the iconostasis in order not to see them. I cannot get emotional and sing at the same time. Using human voice is very revealing. Being tired or being distracted somehow has an immediate effect on the singing. Not being focused means distortion in the singing process. Then you lose the resonance both in your body and with the church. That is why preparing both mentally and physically for the specific funeral situation is so important. It's actually the voice of the cantor that carries the service throughout the whole ritual. Voice is the space where everything else in the funeral takes place. Voice is also the means of communication in the funeral service. In the horizontal level, it communicates with the mourners, and in the vertical level, it communicates with God. What is special from the viewpoint of the author's funeral using the traditional liturgical texts is that the cantor gives voice to or personifies different persons in the hymns she's performing. She re represents the poet who sees how everything that was once alive passes away like the flowers that wither. And she presents the deceased person who is greeting his, his loved ones and is asking from them forgiveness. And, of course, she is the voice of the teaching of the church that the liturgical texts convey in many different ways. The singing voice is used in the church in the same way as the fire in candles or the smoke of incense. These are all immaterial elements with which the congregation approaches the sacred. 
The voice is thus a special ritual element to its invisibility and immateriality. The priest is doing the visible part of the funerals. He blesses the deceased, does the incensing, reads the evangelion, helps the mourners better to understand what they should know or do in the funerals. The priest is moving a lot during the service and he is close to the mourners, close to the deceased. The singer, on the other hand, is standing almost all the service in her place, close to the, to the iconostasis. Only in the beginning and the end of the service, she leads the procession with the coffin to the church and to the graveyard. The singer is not the visible focal point of the funerals. It is the priest's role with the deceased person. But the singer is the oral focal point of the service, not meant to be seen, but meant to be heard. At its best, the singer carries the mourners with her voice, raises the whole service into another level and creates a ritual space through the sung sacred birds. In that space, the priest is the most visible agent, the cantor, the most audible one. From these very initial explora explorations into Orthodox funeral services, I have realized that the embodied perspective provides my research tools that truly work with the holistic character of Eastern Christian worship, in which all senses contribute vitally to the experience. The function and the role of the voice is just one aspect of a much larger picture. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rika. And yes, we are really getting into this uh, bodily involvement also. Thank you for the beautiful recording. Uh, so yes, now it's time for other senses, uh, so vision and images. And our last speaker in that session before our discussion is uh, Lina L ah, Leparskiena. <laughs> Sorry again, and um, Lina works as a researcher uh, at the Institute of Lithuanian Literature and Folklore. Mm, and as far as I could see uh, from the internet sources, just to say something more, she currently works on her postdoctoral research project dedicated to restored sites and roots as inclusive spaces and places, shared imaginations and multi-layered heritage. Yes. And uh, today's talk will be on the image of Our Lady in Trakai, delicate social and private matters behind the glory of miraculous picture uh, of, of Mary in Trakai. So we'll be probably somehow in between Orthodox and Catholic traditions. Yes. So we'll see. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, uh, Lina, the floor is yours, please. Thank you very much for uh, introducing me. And uh, I want uh, just to share some of my methodical approach in the research I do in Trakai. And it's about the recent piety to Our Lady of Trakai. Um, and to be more precise, as you can see from the title, that's what is behind it. And behind it, uh, it's me and communities um, and, and some narratives. Um, so in general, ethnology seeks to, uh, to see more and have a courage to use subjective information is crucial. Uh, and for a research, it means also experimenting uh, with, uh, with own mind in different situations and trying to cross amicatic borders in order to gain access to the deeper layers of human ways of behavior in this world. So at, at, ethnography is one of the possible ways to present uh, subjective delicate matters during the research. I, I think it's ethical issue if life stories are collected and, and it's uh, in my situation. I collect interviews, uh, special life stories, and um, on my opinion, the religion must be treated as a sensitive field uh, because history shows how fragile the um, concept of tolerance is. Uh, because sometimes religion seems about the speaks about the freedom of self-express, and meantime, it builds extra conservative frames which are set by institutions, national narratives, governments, traditions. 
and that divides communities, unfortunately, families, nations. Uh, and auto ethnography is not yet part of um, Lithuanian academic writing tradition, uh, but I'm afraid in my case, I have to learn how to do it and introduce this genre. Um, so let's go to my research place. And this is Trakai, um, um, a multinational place in southeast Lithuania. Um, Catholics, Orthodox, uh, Muslims, uh, Karaims, uh, uh, different denominations, people of different denominations lived here, different nationalities. And um, uh, for many ages, being in this borderland, in, uh, it, it means uh, the East and West civilizations met. And here in Lithuanian Codex, it means that Roman Catholic and Russian Orthodox words meet. And it, uh, and all my life, I observe how this fact actually affects people's behavior. And in my childhood, it happened that um, my family, after atheistic Soviet period, <coughs> uh, have chosen not normal way uh, to become Catholic or maybe indifferent, but the Orthodox denomination. And um, this um, biographical fact had effect on the questions I raised in my recent research because I carry in my memory stories transmitted in the church community about the others from religious worldview and the cliche from, of the national imaginary about the others from cultural perspective of Lithuanians. Being Lithuanian Orthodox means belonging to confronting identities. And at the same time, it makes me free from dangerous narratives once that, that, that builds border, borders. I haven't easily gained personal knowledge how strictly concerned religions are about one or one, only one right way to believe or identify. Many times I was labeled for the wrong choice. Um, and... Um, but methodically, being Orthodox helps me to keep distance by and treat uh, to treat typical Catholic behavior as extraordinary per se. Uh, also, the skill to make division between nationality and faith rooted the skill of induction to see many parts of the puzzle in religious and cultural behavior. And the spiritual quest that I got to go through in my, in my own mind now also serves for the needs of the research when I experiment with my own sensuality of crossing material and spiritual thresholds. Uh, so... Uh, as our topic uh, panel is about bodily expressions in religion, so I, I want to highlight two aspects which present how narrative, memory, knowledge, and religious experience makes effect on the way people see and feel the picture, or don't see and feel, and, and the church as a building and, and the town. One aspect is visibility. Um, another physical rejection of the building or aesthetics of the picture. And the third aspect is mental acceptance of the supernatural behind uh, the rituals. So um, the cult of Our Lady of Trakai is important to the identity of Trakai. And from 15th to 20th century, the church was a main destination for the people to come to Trakai and pray at this miraculous picture. Church was dominating corbanistic object in the landscape. Starting from the Soviet times, when the medieval castle we see now in the island was restored from the ruins, Trakai lost the meaning of sacred site and became point of secular tourist destination. Thought the church was not closed and the picture was not sweep, uh, the knowledge about it was hidden and vanished. And in this situation, um, it illustrates how narrative is important to keep the cult alive and meaningful. Um, so in, in this slide, we see um, the old picture of church and landscape and the picture from the beginning of 20th century where the picture is closed with the curtains. It was kind of ritual to, to open it during the particular um, moment in, in, in the liturgy. Uh, and um, in, uh, and uh, at, back then, the picture was so known and visible and real because the narrative and folk piety existed. In Soviet time, all this knowledge vanished from the mind of Lithuanians, who mostly were immigrants to Trakai, and the local Poles kept the piety, but the Lithuanian and Soviet scholars were not interested in the ways uh, they were expressing it uh, in, on the second half of 20th century, and now Lithuanian ethnologists are not interested in Poles as well. So it's another situation. Um, 
And in my research, um, I can see now how the picture is uncovered uh, physically, and but mentally the curtain still exists. Even though it's already 10 years since the cult is restored, pilgrims each year repeat the march from Vilnius to Trakai, the aftermath of silence in Soviet period and lack of proper communication or propaganda now is obvious. Uh, the uh, the Trakai is, you can is already restor restored its reputation as a sacred place uh, for the Catholics, but um, these pilgrims are carrying the image of Our Lady of Trakai, but they don't understand why they are doing it. I, I find out it during my interviews. Uh, they don't know any history of, of, this, uh, of this picture, uh, any narrative that was really, really weird. Uh, and and um, they are coming here as a touristic place. This narrative prevails. And uh, what the, the lack is that... Um, here I quote uh, uh, a short quote from the talk that uh, Bishop of Vilnius um, uh, gave in 2017, and this kind of short narrative that shows how important it is to the history of Lithuania, this picture, the first one, crown by crowns with the, of the Pope, and so on and so on, has a relation with the um, conversion of Lithuania to Christianity, but uh, this narrative was transmitted in, in 17, uh, 2017 and 18, but now it's stopped and the lack of this communication is very, very obvious. Another narrative very important is, is legend written on the backside of, um, of the picture that it was a present to Vidotas the Great, um, the, the duke that lived in Lithuania's 14th, 15th century, one of the most probably most important historical hero in Lithuanian history. Um, he got the, this picture as a present from Byzantine Emperor Emanolog Palolog II. Um, and uh, it explains why the picture actually looks like an icon. Art historian had proved that uh, the, the picture was um, remade. Uh, it was first of all Bella Madonna, Italian picture, and it was uh, repainted as a as a Byzantine icon in order to make it closer to 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 the legend that it is present from Byzantine emperor, and. Uh, it, it makes sense when I ask people, the Catholics, how they treat aesthetically this picture. They say that uh, it's not very you know, ours. It doesn't look like Catholic. So they don't ap appreciate this picture as a beautiful um, from religious uh, point of view. At the same time, uh, Orthodox, and we see in the, in the picture just in the corner in Trakai, the Orthodox Church and the Catholic Church is very are very close. And uh, when I speak to my community, Orthodox community, let's go to the church, I will lead you excursion, I will tell you about this history and of the picture. They don't want to go there and they don't uh, also take it as theirs. Uh, and uh, here my um, my knowledge of being Orthodox in the early 90s helps me to understand what's happening. Um, uh, because um, um, when Lithuania got independence, the atheistic Soviet Union has fallen. At the same time, both denominations, Catholic and Orthodox, started their relations from the old position, looking at each other as heretic on the one hand and in the light of national conflict on the other because being Catholic means to be Lithuanian, being Orthodox means to be Russian, the enemy actually. And I remember many anti-Catholic and anti-Semitic narratives spread in the community of the Orthodox Church, which meant that even entering Catholic shrine or synagogue, moreover taking sacraments, was treated as sin and moreover an insult to God. So for some time, uh, as a result of this indoctrination, I've stopped attending church, um, Catholic Church being afraid to get the sin. Uh, uh, so... Uh, if without this experience, I, I wouldn't draw my, my research in this direction, trying to understand this anti-Catholic position of orthodoxes. So the border still exists. And COVID situation, um, this uh, also opened another another thing that, and um, one thing that uh, uh, equalized both churches and priests of one and another, they told the same narrative that Corona emptied the churches and realized what Soviets intended 
to did, but didn't manage. So because the church became unsafe place, and also. Um, in our days, if faithful people, um, in our days, uh, uh, ju- faithful people are judged from a modern and liberal people because they treat uh, um, attending church as irrational. So um, this narrative works also as a physical border to enter the building, even if you, even though you are not religious. So the third aspect. Um, is self-reflecting and it's part of, of my life story and my story of my mother. Um, when she was on a threshold what to choose the um, uh, Orthodox or, or Catholic, she had a dream uh, where the Catholic Church appeared as very cold and the Orthodox Church was warm and pleasant. And it was a f- this dream made a final decision to her and actually to me because I was a child. I was going where my mother was taking me. Uh, even though my mother is Lithuanian and sometimes it's not easy for her to hear this pro-Slavic, pro-Russian propaganda from the mouth of the priest. Uh, but supernatural, symbolic, irrational experiences plays the fatalic role in her choice. Um, in my research, I'm trying um, to control my various roles uh, and sometimes intentionally I allow myself simply be a believer in order to understand how rituals works. In this way, I think I discovered meaning, for example, of the rosary, which I treated earlier as something boring and even unpleasant to listen <laughs> because it's um, from uh, from musical point of view, and also adoration, kind of internal worship, a new kind of ritual I didn't know earlier. So this is um, uh, part of my diary. After this adoration, uh, when um, it, it's it's a situation when you just sit all the night at the front of the picture. And you have to worship it or look what happens with you. And uh, I started to see what happens with uh, with my mind. And it appeared that uh, I, 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 the picture mirrors me, my life story. Um, uh, and uh, it was very uh, sensitive experience. And I wonder, of course, what, what kind of dialogue other people have. Uh, so it's it's um, to to sum to sum up. Um, now it's a challenge how to present my self-reflective re- perspective in the research, to learn autographic writing, and the challenge um, to talk uh, about things that seems to be very well known for a Catholics, for example. But I treat it as um, an extraordinary, like rosary or adoration, or, or in general. To be religious, it's it's a phenomenon. So thank you for our kind attention. Hey, wonderful, thank you, thank you, Lina. Uh, well, so we received three five wonderful presentations, and I believe there will be a very hot discussion. Uh, we also can relate to morning papers if you if you wish, uh, because it's like the second part of our. Mm, panel on bodies uh, and uh, in the context of rules and religions. And I think there are many, many actually topics here. So we, we are having autoethnography. We are having this idea that our own body uh, as, as researchers is well part of the process. And uh, it puts so many questions. Uh, we are having issues connected also with, well, politics, so politics and poetics of bodies in uh, in various religious contexts uh, and various kinds of media. So body as a medium, but also um, rituals as, as mediums, certain objects, uh, well, alcohol. Uh, so what we intake uh, in the religious context or what we are banned. From, from doing, etc. So the floor is open for discussion and I will also try to check chats uh, together, I hope with Torsten uh, as a co-convener. And yeah, I see that Mircha uh, is having a question. Also, you can um, try to use this sign icon from the Zoom, but yeah, I could see Mircha. So I think this is the first question, please. 
Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Great work. Uh, I have a question for, for uh, Rika. Thank you for the wonderful uh, presentation. And my question is, uh, uh, um, simply, how does the community um, who identifies, uh, according to your uh, nice presentation, to your nice talk, identifies to, to the voice of the singer um, when, when it is obvious, at least for your, for your recording, that um, uh, the voice is an educated one? Is a trained voice in a, in an academic sense. I ask this because because uh, in in uh, some congregation, or at least in the Orthodox media, uh, the the trained singer are not very really well looked at. You know, it's not natural, it's not original, okay, not authentic, and so on. So uh, this is the, the the question: How does the the trained voice, you know, the academically trained voice, uh, fit in this uh, very traditional and intimate space? Thank you. Thank you, Mirza. Um, Actually, people here are used to listening to these kind of voices. We don't have so many traditional voices anywhere to be heard. So, and and our music, because it's actually it's not uh, you, mono mono the not not using only one voice. Actually, it's four voices what we use all the time. So, for to sing this, you need to have some education to understand and to hear. Actually, you cannot do it probably without some education. So, I think that's. Uh, my voice told you about the environment, environment where I am living in. So that, that this is normal here. That's what they expect to hear, I guess. Did I answer your question? Okay, it, it seems yes, and and thank you. It's indeed it's fascinating, and yeah. <laughs> uh, Mm, so I see Anders is having another question, so please. Yes, uh, it is very interesting, uh, these uh, five lectures. In Scandinavia, we have one big religion, so to say, um, the Protestantism uh, Lutheran. Uh, but in Eastern Finland, we have Orthodox, and we have seen this in Rika's paper. Uh, on uh, I see in... In Lithuania, we have Catholics and also Orthodox, and in Romania, uh, especially um, Orthodox and Catholics. So, uh, so we have in Europe special situations. Uh, in Sweden, we have this about the state, earlier state church, Lutheran, on the three uh, revival movements. So, uh, when we study folk religion, we can compare in our countries. So um, uh, now we have also discussed auto-ethnography and in Sweden and Scandinavia it is rather usual, but I see uh, the last two, especially um, papers about uh, auto-ethnography. So I understand, Rika, you can understand better the cantors when you have a field work with other cantors. So when I, I am not a musician, but if I had made this study, uh, what, what will be better when you make these studies? You, you are a cantor and you study these feelings and so on. Uh, uh, so it's an example. I, not a musician, uh, field work, on you, cantor, field work. That is, what does it mean? Is ethnography something good uh, or not? Uh, we have, uh, I see in Lithuania, it is not so welcome to be uh, autoethnograph, uh, I see. Uh, and I've asked also why. Uh, for earlier, we had this ob objective researcher but autoethnography, that is a, the subjective researcher. So um, when we go to the subjective researcher more and more, then you know, the method of autoethnography will be much more useful. So uh, that was some question to both of you using autoethnography met methods. Uh, you have chosen them, and it is good. On there are also critics, but how to meet the critics? The, the, the positive effects are so important. Can you say something about that? 
close to you. Thank you. Thank you, Anders. So I think it's well, like to Lina and Rika, but probably I believe to many other people here. But anyway, Rika, Rika Lina, would you like to answer, comment at something? So if I start, um, this method for me is quite new. So I have not had a lot of feedback of doing it, but I guess it will be quite interesting because I'm the first one who is using this method in this church. But at the same time, I feel that I can find it's, it's, it can bring so much interesting information from inside and afterwards you compare it with the outer circle and with the culture you're living in. It's... It, I I am quite sure that they will it will be a very good tool to do this part of my study because the first part is just I've been do, doing research on laments that are in archives or laments that are in northern Greece and I've been doing field work but now I'm changing uh, perspective and taking myself as the subject and the object and I compare my findings from these laments and what I learned there to my own experience. And I think it's, I find it interesting and fruitful. But, but, and I very much like Lina's paper and the way how you, you see yourself on the border of this Catholic and Orthodox being, like we are here, the majority are Lutheran, and it has a strong influence on everything what we do and how we look at things. And, and yeah, so I would also like to thank Paulina's paper. It was very nice. Thank you, Rika, for, 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 a, for a feedback. And I, I, I would also to, uh, I enjoyed your paper and I also... I also chanting in the in the choir of, of Orthodox Church, so I a bit know how it's what is the feeling, and um, I wonder how is it in in Finland because in in this Russian Orthodox tradition, uh, the most beautiful melodically chants are of lamentations and and when you chant uh, when someone is dead actually <laughs> at least for me it's maybe subjective but it's the most beautiful uh, even more beautiful than the wedding and so on um, uh, if if to speak about um a, a, a autonographic method um it, it it will come soon because um, people, um, my colleagues, uh, start to make research on life stories. Uh, but it's so, uh, so with these life stories, uh, everything changes. But at the same time, because we, the folklorist has um, kind of um, opposition of for historians because historians they don't treat our methods as serious or sufficient. So you have um, uh, you have to stand for your methods uh, in a professional way. You have to craft uh, writing. This is the only way how how to make this method legal in academic society. Otherwise, you will be treated as someone not not so much serious and maybe behind the border of of of, of science. Something not not like that. And uh, if if uh, I'm allowed, I would like to give a question to um, how to pronounce it. Pro good, Mir Mircea, yes, um, about the political aspect of 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 this uh, cult how how are these relics uh, against if if i understand to it cl clearly against official church H how because I, I was listening to 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 the paper you mentioned some things but i would like to maybe make more stress yeah, so, on something mm -hmm. yeah thank you thank you so uh there are a number of, of uh, corpses of dead people who, who have very problematic biographies because they, they belonged, they were, uh, uh, they were very uh, famous legionnaires. They, they were very active in those, uh, you know, uh, um, criminal organizations from the interwar period. So they were very uh, anti-communist figures. So because of that, they are celebrated now throughout Romania, but still, they have that serious prob problem from uh, before communism as being very much engaged with the anti-Semitic movement, xenophobic elements, and that was really criminal organization. So even, even today, uh, a lot of monasteries in Romania are very attached to that ideology 
and they, they display it, the signs, the symbols, they sing the chants and, uh, you know, appear somewhere to, to perform anti-gay uh, parades or so on. So, um, in this sense, uh, the, these, uh, the church cannot or is very uh, shy in, in approving these guys because it, it, it would uh, somehow uh, uh, challenge the structures of the state who forbid celebrating the memory of criminals of war. Or, or criminals, generally speaking. So th this is one one uh, very short, uh, very short answer. Thank you. Yeah. Elina, microphone. We okay. have a, a bit similar situation with partisans, who s sometimes maybe they participated in in this um, in genocide, maybe, but uh, but it's it's not. It's, it's, you are not allowed it to speak it loudly, <laughs> oh, mm -hmm. so it's it's a bit like a f forbidden topics, mm -hmm. even even in, in even for scientists. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, yes, yes. Thank Fantastic. you. And apologies for not having camera on. My internet connection has been a little bit difficult today. But uh, I have a question for Andre Anders. And first of all, I would like to thank you for your paper. Uh, my own study focuses on pre-modern Swedish-speaking Ostrobothnia in Finland, where revival movements were and still are very popular. And in this region, alcohol was used in vernacular magical healing. So I was wondering if in your material you have come across arguments against alcohol consumption as part of vernacular healing or beliefs in any way. Thank you. It, it, it was uh, a little difficult to hear. Can Anna repeat the question? I couldn't hear so good. Anna? Okay, yes, I will try. It was the question about the vernacular healing in your context, you study. Uh, was alcohol being used in vernacular healing practices from, from the field uh, and material you worked on? Uh, so like, you know, folk healing, et cetera. Yes, I, I also posted my question on the chat if it's easier to read from there. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you, Carolina. I'll try. So you mean in folk healing? Uh, yes. Uh, I healing, am. healing. He so like uh, if someone was sick and healing practices, uh, there is, if you read the chat, there's magical practices. Yes, you mean alcohol as magic, yes? Yes. 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 Uh, I have written another book about that uh, in folklore. So uh, earlier, uh, that was very important. I have, uh, I am part of a new anthology about um, uh, pandemics. And I have written about cholera in the 19th century. On there was very important use of alcohol at that time. Uh, so uh, when you, that was the big healing. Today uh, we we you know, forbid shops to sell alcohol in Sweden and Norway this year. But at that time, alcohol was the you know, the healing. Uh, so when you was very sick the best to, to do was to use alcohol. For example, the dead bodies were sent to alcoholic cemeteries, especially on he who transported them by a wagon, uh, he would drink much of alcohol. For th that was the best remedy against uh, this pandemic. So, uh, and we have many other things in older uh, traditions about that. But it was a problem for the priest uh, that was not mo moderation, and it was also any more um, problem for um, for revival movements. But it was in the 19th century. I, uh, in my paper today, I especially uh, taken the. 20th century, and then it was not so much used. And we have these big uh, temperance movements, in, in, especially in Sweden. They have been very strong, so they have taken away these uh, thinkings about uh, alcohol as magic, but earlier, very important. So that was 
I, I was surprised when I studied al alcohol on cholera that it was so important. So you must be a very abuser. Um, at that time, moderation was, you know, was in the center. But when we had the pandemic, then you could be a, an abuser to, uh, to save your life. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Carolina, for your question and Anders for, for answering. I see Torsten is having a question. Uh, I believe Victoria was first. Oh, I didn't see someone. I'm very sorry. Maybe I'm not having a proper view on my... Okay. Um, thank oh, you, Torsten. Um, well, I have. Uh, thank you so much for your presentations. I have um, um, two questions. I, I I wanted to ask Rika. I I am I am. I don't know a lot about Christianity, so I was wondering. So um, the voice the voice is very gendered. So um, what role does it play? Because I know from the Jewish context that usually in the Orthodox context it's um, um, only the male voice people listen to the cantor um but i don't know how it is um in the christian context so i wonder what role does the female voice play in it and um and then i have another second comment on monica thank you for your paper you know on the goddess worship yes i know that from the neo pagan background but um um there i i only want to comment on isn't it very strict to say that it is a Western binary? Because when I look at pantheons, um, European pantheons, we have a lot of queer figures in it. And um, when you look on the contemporary neo-pagan context, for instance, you know, um, they always shift those genders and go away from, uh, from the binary. And actually the, the old pantheons, offer like the nordic pantheons offer a lot of figures which are i would say queer but you could say non-binary and they actually celebrate that very much so i wonder if it isn't too harsh to say this is the western binary it's always the western binary whereas all the others have those fluid concepts but we are here stuck with our modernity and um you know and need to come back to you know what all the others do so I, I, that's a bit challenging. I, I, I really la loved your presentation, but just to wonder, the, uh, you know, just a comment. Thank you. Good to be challenged. And I think I didn't see your hand because the yellow appears somehow on your window. So that's, I'm sorry. So uh, I think the relatively short question to Rika and then Monica answering and commenting, please. Thank you, Victoria, for your question. It's it's a good question, I think, because now you see in Finland there has been 40 years female cantors. And before that, only male uh, male cantors. And that has been because the cantors have, have been and still are a kind of part of the priesthood or the part of the hierarchy. hierarchy. But actually, in, a, in the uh, end of 19th century, in the 19th century, they, they took female singers in the choirs in St. Petersburg. In, in the authors. Uh, so they began to take female voices in. And of course, before that, there has been in, in convent, um, nuns singing in, in their convents and, and so on. But uh, it's even now, people many times expect to hear male voices from the choir. So they say, because I, my choir, I have all, all, all plan had both female and male singers, it's mixed choir, and they come and thank me for having male voices always. So that's, that's something they expect to hear and keep, I don't know what's the meaning of it. So it's so important and you must say that that's, that's why your choir is good because you have good male voices, but it, it is an issue. I don't know yet what it means, actually. Anyway. Interesting, thank you. Thank you, and Monica, please. Yeah. <laughs> Not easy. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, thank you, Victoria, for this um, 
for this comment yes um yeah i acknowledge uh, that yeah i think uh, um two two things to that one is that yeah in my thesis i am a little bit more elaborate on all this and i do refer to the you know uh, mainstream sort of modern kind of um conceptions um but yeah no i acknowledge that i need to be a little bit more generous i guess um it's part of the process <laughs> But yeah, no, I, I am. I, I I shall maybe elaborate it more also when it comes to like shorter presentations. Yeah, thanks for for the comment. Yeah. No, but thank you for a presentation. I just yes. <laughs> well, I think we all deal with with the same question usually uh, when we when we try to actually be outside of binaries and well searching for language. Also, I think it's it's just you know such an important issue to discuss. Mm, what can we do with that? Okay, and Th Thorsten. <laughs> Thank you, Anna. Uh, this is a question to Mircea uh, and the notion of um, necro politics you were mentioning. I was just wondering if you, since I'm not familiar with the term, um, you said it's uh, branded by Mbib. Could you tell us a little bit about that and especially in how far it inspired your interpretation? Yeah, yeah. It, it, I didn't uh, uh, work too much on. I, I mean, I didn't uh, elaborate too much on this presentation. But uh, yes, I did some work on that. Yeah, it's uh, it's a, 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 a term coined from Foucault, from a necro power, a bio power, the way of using death and human relics um, uh, in order to achieve power, in order to to construct uh, one's interest, one privilege by the by the management of death or power of of corpses, and to to construct policies politics and uh, so on. So in, in my uh, larger presentation, I have a, also a chapter on, on suppressed bodies, on suppressed relics. So uh, on relics that did not have this chance, uh, this, the chance for this uh, you know, trajectory to become relics because they have been uh, suppressed by, uh, by uh, the religious competitor, so to say, for instance, by the Orthodox Church who have found a, a, another church's saint and just suppressed it. Yes, or by in the uh, a very interesting case in the uh, 80s when the Securitate, the Ceausescu's political police, just ran into a relic, uh, a sort of uh, 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 old style uh, Orthodox bishop, uh, and he was uh, found intact and so on, all the, all the discourse, and they didn't know what to do, and they, they just stole it, they just took it, ran away with it by car, and uh, nobody knows what happened to them, but, but community still has the, the idea, the, the story, and uh, they are still searching for the body, so a necro power, I mean, I would uh, put it here, to, to, the, to the way of, uh, of uh, managing, you know, the suppression of, of bodies, uh, you know, th this aggression on the, onto the dead, Onto, onto the already dead, you know, to, to put it in a scheme of, of power. Yeah. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. I'm, uh, I might have a one question or maybe two questions for Monica. Oh, I see Anders. Anders, maybe you start. Will I start? Yes. Or? Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, we have now discussed about this uh, in the in Finland or in Romania, and uh, we have a research network about thanatology, uh, and we have this in Europe and also in Scandinavia, the Nordic countries. So um, earlier, Philippe Arie said we have taboo of uh, death and dying, but uh, we have now found, especially a Danish sociologist, um, uh, Jakobsen, he has said, we have not any longer this taboo. So my question to both Finland and Romania, how it is in Romania? I have read Irina Stahl's study about uh, uh, placing crosses near the ways of the car accidents. So uh, can we say also in Romania that we have a new time, no, not a taboo. Uh, perhaps you have not had it in Romania, but in other countries in Europe we have had it. So when I see your um, pictures, uh, I will be a little afraid. Uh, but th that is a new view 
it is not so dangerous to die on to study the dead corpses. <laughs> so uh, that is a new view, view in the society, perhaps. So that is my question. Thank you. Yeah, I, I shall be very brief. Yeah, in, in Romania, uh, um, yeah, uh, um, um, ritual, ritual uh, or uh, uh, death rituals or funerary rites are still involve a lot of physical activity. So the physicality of the body is still is still very much dealt with in in all sorts of uh, lustration rituals, in the uh, lamentation rituals, and in um, uh, all other uh, uh, rituals very close to death, and they are still very much performed even today. Even when when persons apply to to the services of you know companies who do that, uh, uh, still there is a lot of uh, physicality involved in the in the. Uh, ritual management of the body. Besides that, in, in Romania, they're still very famous and very largely practiced the, the seventh year burial, reburial, you know, the, the exhumation of the body after seven years. And the family has to do visually with this experience to, to uh, engage with it, to collect the bones, to put them somewhere and to do a liturgy there on that moment. And many say because, uh, because of this, you know, intimacy with the corpse, uh, in Romania, they're still so powerful. This cult, this cult for the relics, they they put this in in relation to to that. So, uh, yeah, I, I think in Romania, there's still um, uh, you know this uh, you know uh, how Philippe Arie put it in the first you know the death which is uh, of tamed you know tamed death. I think it's his expression. Uh, uh, so people still engage very intimately with intimately with the with the corpse with the with the death body. So uh, that's okay so far. Thank you. So that. So therefore, we scholars, we will be more, much more interested in these things. Earlier, it was not so, so important uh, to study death, but now more and more. Mm. On, uh, in this uh, network of Thanatology, I have seen it. So in 2012, I uh, edited a book about cultural studies on death and dying in Scandinavia. So, so that is a network. Death and dying is mm. a special problem field in ethnology and folklore. That is something important in the 2010s. So, so therefore, I am interested in what happened there in your country. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And I see Alexi is having a question, so I will just give a floor to him, Alexi. Mm. Yes, uh, thank you. But didn't Rika want, want to say something to answer or answer first? Uh, I don't hear you well. Uh, Alexi asked if I want to say something as a comment to Anders. Ah, okay. I guess uh, just a short comment. So I guess that we are not having this taboo so strong anymore. This is changing now. So I, I feel that what you say that it, there has been, and it's I, I think it's the, because of the Second World War and all these bloody things that have happened. There we didn't want to look at death, and after that came this counter movement with uh, the people want to go closer to the dead people. And in Finnish Orthodox Church, we are living under the dominance of the prophet, uh, Protestant ch Church, which means that our ritual behavior is strongly influenced by the pro Protestants, and our dealing with death is not so physical it, as it would be in Russia among the Orthodox people, for example. Just a short comment. Okay, very good. And thank you, Alexi, for reminding me. <laughs> no, no worries. <laughs> Uh, I hope you can hear me well now. Uh, so I have yes. one question for uh, Mircha and, and then another one for Monica. Uh, so Mircha, you talked about the agency of the, the relics and that they want to be touched uh, or, or loved or I don't remember exactly how you, you phrased it, but how does that appear uh, in, in the sources that you use uh, concretely? Um, and then uh, for Monica, the question was um, like to follow follow up with uh, what has been said about the Western binary. Uh, is there an influence, maybe of post-colonial studies, within your informants that do do your informants in in like talk about the Western binaries and talk about decolonization? Um, so, so do they use this concept of, of Western binary and oppose it to, to their own 
uh, understanding or is it something that you you just uh, do as a researcher yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Alexei. Uh, yes, uh, well, usually relics are, are approached in, in some, uh, in some uh, authorized forms, in some sensational forms, as, as Maya would, would put it. And yeah, uh, uh, when, when you approach a, a, a relic, there's some, some gestures physically you have to do because they are, they are placed somehow uh, 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 in a lower position. Your, your body has to go to them, right? So uh, uh, if there is a mouth uh, or a... Or a as, as you've seen, the the, the body of Father uh, Le Catouche, uh people would would go very close to his mouth and to uh, place his ear very close to his uh, mouth. Maybe they hear something. Uh, um, they observe, you know, very his, his hands very closely, and there, there's a strong connection to the to the physicality of the relics. And in in a way, these these uh, the, this way of relating to them is is made. I repeat, in, in authorized forms, in in ways which. Uh, command in a way the body well of course in this community of, of uh, worshippers who are uh, uh, who have uh, acquired some techniques of the body some some uh, uh, authorized uh, forms to to uh, to relate to the body in a way that is uh, significant and effective so in this sense I, I mean that there's a connection between uh, you know relics and uh, uh, the way they expect to be approached right uh, okay thank you just a very brief technical comment. We are saying goodbye to Vilma, our wonderful volunteer. We should clap her, who was supporting our two sessions. And we are still allowed to have a few more minutes. But just remember, guys, uh, quarter after four Helsinki time, there is the uh, closing keynote. But if, if only there is energy, we still have few more minutes and discussion is really yeah, warming up. So uh, this was my technical information and really I would love to thank, uh, thank Vilma. So uh, I think Monica, if you, if you have time and you're still here, you can answer and comment. Yes, Vilma appeared. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, Alexi. Um, yeah, no, so the informants themselves did not really refer to the spinery, uh, but my, uh, my research is informed by a very decolonial stance. Uh, I'm very much uh, engaged in that also uh, beyond my PhD thesis. Uh, so maybe <laughs> that's where the hope is coming from. But the other thing is also that I have been, I have lived in India for, uh, in South India for like nine years so um, I don't know, it's just a feeling that the, the genders and bodies are just perceived differently from how it is in the European context, in the Western context. So maybe that's a bit where also this, um, uh, the, yeah, my stance is coming from, um, because I, I find uh, also, I think uh, maybe Anna mentioned that, I find it also very difficult to find the language, to find the terminology, to um, translate certain notions when it comes to gender, body, uh, motherhood also. Motherhood is, is also conceived very differently because also men are called Amma, are called mothers. Um, so um, I do still see this, the constriction of the binaries. Uh, maybe I'm I'm just not I'm putting it a bit too much too aggressively, but um, yeah, I do see that. Um, another thing that I wanted to add is that while the informants with whom I have worked with, um, which is a small case study in South India, have not used uh, the post-colonial narrative, this is something that the the, um, the central government has in recent years been using uh, sometimes. Uh, I don't know if you are familiar with the BJP, um, which is this right, like it's, it's a quite fundamentalist government, which is trying to uh, promote a mainstream Hinduism, which has, uh, it's called Hindutva, this type of ideology, um, where they propose an anti-Western narrative, so to say, like, okay, yeah, these are big words, but it's, um, they are proposing certain ideals by saying that this is a reliving of the local tradition in order to overcome the colonial time. And this 
comes also with a rejection of English sometimes. It comes in, in, in various forms, which, yes, uh, I, I fully support a decolonial stance, but not really how the current government is, um, is portraying it, because yeah, it's, it's very, very problematic. Uh, at the disadvantage of a lot of traditions, also of the tradition that I have been studying, which is not mainstream, it's an esoteric tradition. So any uh, and, and Muslims and the Christians living there, they have been oppressed a lot recently under this fake, I would like to say almost, decolonial narrative. So, yeah, I hope to have answered the question. I think very important what, what Monica was trying to explain. Okay, we are just five minutes after our time. I had a sort of brief questions for Monica to which some of you, you, you uh, touched upon because I was wondering, are you going to introduce autoethnography in your project because it's, it's a very deep project. And second was actually about the political and social circumstances. So how the people who are outside of the caste system and outside of the, well, gendered, well, female male system. So who is rejoining this movement? Is, is this social and political background also to join that kind of movement you were talking about? Okay. Um, yes. So to the first question about autoethnography, um, like not formally, this is not autoethnography, but I have, um, uh, I have been initiated into the tradition. And I have been in, in like my fieldwork was in 2017, but I have been um, connected with it since 2014 and I'm still um, connected with it. So I, I am using something that I call um, fieldwork as dwelling because I am exposing myself to being worlded in that world and to contribute to worlding it. So um, I'm, I'm looking in terms of cosmologies and I'm like part of that, the moment I um, uh, really, um, you know, am immersed in it. Um, I have a problem, like I think a lot of anthropologists have a problem with this uh, idea of uh, self and other, this division of object, objective versus subjective. So this never really um, was possible for me to, to think in those terms. But on the other hand, because I have this decolonial approach, I also find it problematic that me as a foreigner, privileged uh, woman coming there uh, is relating my own story. I, I have a problem with that as well. So what I have really tried to do is to sort of uh, participate at a very profound level so that I have like a different type of report, which is not like, you know, limited by this objective subjective kind of thing, but I also don't make my experience the center of my um, of my research because, I don't know, I want the voices of local uh, women and men to be the protagonists. Uh, regarding the second question, so it's, it's a very complex situation in India with, um, like India is huge, it's a subcontinent. So what is going on centrally, like in Delhi, uh, is not necessarily the same as what happens in the South. And this is a rural place which has very strong, uh, yeah, local connections. Um, but I must admit that it becomes um, it's creeping in, you know, this, uh, this, this larger narrative of Hindutva. Um, also, for example, because there are funds, funds which are being distributed to foundations, uh, which are, they are also local, they are local major temples. I don't know if you have heard of Tirupati also. And from there, then funds are distributed to a network of uh, you know, regional temples. And in order to get those fundings, there is also, of course, you know, the, an exchange of ideas that then results in this, uh, you know, spreading of a more mainstream or more sanitized, uh, sanitized version. In any case, these uh, tantric traditions, such as Yashri Vidya as well, they have undergone like a very important sanitization process for, for centuries. Um, so when I'm working, and also they have become secret or, or have gone, have disappeared altogether. But so when I'm working, it's like semi-secret um, and a lot of um, like the, the biggest authority is the guru, uh, Guruji, who um, 
genuinely was beyond any of these caste restrictions and gender restrictions. So he, even though he passed away recently, um, his word is still authoritative, but I have seen in the recent years how there has been a lot of, um, you know, refashioning of, of, of the narrative also there. So it, it, everyone has to see what happens over the next few years. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. So we took 10 more minutes than we were well, we were allowed to, to use those 10 minutes. And well, uh, Thorsten, you might uh, sum up somehow uh, on this behalf of me and Thorsten, or <laughs> uh, we, we should yeah say goodbye to all of you. Uh, I think it was fascinating morning session and the afternoon session. So Thorsten, just last words as a <laughs> convener. <laughs> Well, there's not much to add. I think um, I really enjoyed this uh, panel with you. Um, yeah, gave me some things to think about in terms of our uh, offer of necrophy uh, and its understanding. So I guess we're going to continue to reflect upon that at home in our own research. Uh, I don't have anything more to add to what you just said. So from my part, Thank you very much for taking part in this panel. I guess. Um, yes, thanking all the panelists and all people who participated as audience with questions. And I think our bodies need really those 20 minutes break before the closing, closing lecture. So enjoy your afternoon, enjoy the well final day of the Congress. And thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.